Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Thank you for being here. It seems that I have this knack of scheduling very important meetings with very important guest speakers in the middle of very bad weather. But yet you all still come. So thank you. <laughs> so um, I have. It, it is very, very important to me um, when it comes to dementia, Alzheimer's, and a dementia-friendly community. And Sturbridge, as you may or may not know, has recently taken an oath and the pledge to become a dementia-friendly community. And I personally feel that in order for us to be successful at this, we have to have the, the, the knowledge, the information, the training, the experience, so that we can make this tremendous. A few months ago, I had the pleasure of hearing Dr. Jackson um, at a workshop presentation that I attended and knew we just had to have him here. So, without any further ado, I would love to turn the floor over. It was my honor to introduce Dr. Jonathan Jackson. Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. I'm so sorry for being late. Um, I've given a lot of presentations all over Massachusetts and I think I've only been late twice, so I apologize if this is the, the second occasion for that. So uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about the brain, aging, and memory loss, uh, and then I'll save some time at the end to hear some of your questions and I'll try to give you the answers that I have from uh, the very, very cutting edge of scientific research uh, on this topic. All right. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I uh, just wanted to start off by offering my disclosure statement. Uh, this is where every dime that comes into uh, my research center or uh, into my salary comes from. And whenever somebody is telling you about something that you don't know about and you have no idea who they are and you're not sure of their agenda, you need to know where the money's coming from. Always follow the money. So make sure that you demand these kinds of statements uh, from any speaker that's talking to you. Um, I receive uh, funding from Mass General Hospital, and I've got uh, grants from Mass General Hospital, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, uh, the Alzheimer's Therapeutic Research Institute, and the All of Us Precision Medicine Initiative. We won't be talking in detail about any of these things today, but in case uh, you're worried about any kind of uh, influence uh, from, from big money, <laughs> this is not big money, <laughs> uh, just wanted to put that out there, okay? Uh, so we've got four goals for today. So we're going to start off by talking about how memory works and where memories are stored in the brain. Then we're going to talk about what goes wrong in Alzheimer's disease. And I'll also follow up with some of the latest research on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so a couple of you in this room have seen this talk before. I guarantee you, you haven't heard uh, the latest research. So uh, the information that I have here uh, is as recent as one week old. So we're, we're talking about the very, very latest information on AD. And then if we've got a little bit of time, I'd like to show you or uh, give you some advice informed by science, confirmed by science, about how to age gracefully. Things that you can do right now to lower your risk of uh, ever kind of, uh, developing dementia. Okay, so let's get started by talking about how memory works and where memories are stored in the brain. Uh, so most people think of memory working something along these lines. Uh, inside your head, there's like a little projector, and if I ask you what you were doing last Friday night at 7 p.m., you rewind that little projector. Inside your head, you hit play, and it kind of brings up you uh, relaxing with your family and friends, maybe partying out at a club. I think you see some of you kind of kind of wild out there in the back. Uh, but one thing that we've learned uh, from about 125 years of memory research is that memory does not work like this at all. It's not a video camera inside your head. It's not something that you can pull up on demand. It's not just one thing. So many of us get really frustrated with how memory works uh, and how it's structured in our brain. We have those senior moments. We walk into a room and we can't remember why we're there. We can't remember where we put our keys. We're trying to think about what we had for dinner last night. We're coming up empty. All of these things are normal. And I hopefully by the end of this talk, you will appreciate that memory is so complex that it's a minor miracle that it ever works, let alone that we have a few occasional hiccups. Okay? So if memory doesn't work like this, what's a better way of thinking about memory? So um, I, I have like a, a six-year-old daughter, so 
Uh, when I thought of a better metaphor for memory, I turned to this. Does everybody know what Legos are? Okay, so everybody's nodding good. Anybody's not familiar, catch me after the talk, I'll explain it to you. Um, so as, as a father, I'm more familiar with stepping on Legos in the morning uh, than actually getting to play with them. But uh, Legos are a much better metaphor for how memory works than a video camera, than a projector, uh, than the things that we normally think of. The reason why is because memory is a reconstructive process. When you first create a memory, you have to assemble a lot of pieces in just the right way. And when you retrieve a memory, when you call something back into your mind's eye, uh, you have to rebuild that. So every time you re retrieve a memory, you have to rebuild it from those pieces. So this has two major consequences <clears throat> that seem a little contradictory, but they're actually very well glued together. The first one is that older memories are stronger than newer ones. More distinct memories are stronger than less distinct ones, which is why you can remember that really awful fight you had with your spouse back in 1987, but you can't remember what you had for dinner on Tuesday. One of those things is more distinct than the other. One of those things is older than the other. So that older, more distinct memory is stronger because you practice rebuilding those Lego memories so many times. The other thing that happens with old memories is that they change. They don't change all at once. They change just a little bit at a time over a period of years or decades. So going back to that fight that you had in 1987, you both do literally remember it differently. And you're both right. And you're also both wrong. So, uh, memories change very slowly over time, but they also strengthen over time as well, okay? So when you're thinking about memory and how it works, instead of thinking about the video camera, think about Lego. Think about the process of rebuilding, and think about uh, you know, how much you need each and every one of those pieces to create a complete memory, okay? So the first evidence that we had for Lego memories came with a phenomenon that scientists call, you might want to take notes, the tip of the tongue phenomenon. Who's ever had one of those tip of the tongue states before? <laughs> it's on the tip of the tongue. Yeah, it's like, yeah. maybe I'm not quite sure I am. Yeah, so uh, I'll give you a classic example of the tip of the tongue phenomenon. So do you know that movie with that guy in it? <laughs> ah, he was in all those movies in the 90s with that blonde lady. And his first name starts with the T, maybe? And his last name is one syllable. And it's just like, if you just told me the answer, I know I would say, yes, yes that's right, or no, that's wrong. But uh, it's just kind of right there where you almost kind of put together that it was Tom Hanks that I'm talking about. Okay. So, yeah, so there you go. You have that where you're like, yes, that fits all the pieces. That's an example of where you're missing just a couple of Lego pieces where you have something that's very, very powerful and very, very familiar, but you don't have the right two pieces to make that Lego memory complete, okay? So now that we know a little bit more about how memory works, that it's more like Lego than a video camera, let's talk about where memories are stored or where they're reassembled or rebuilt in the brain. So uh, this is a big cartoon picture of the brain. It is a, it's not a real brain. Um, for one, the brain is not nearly this colorful. And for two, it doesn't usually have words written on it. So uh, this is where I have to humbly disclose that there are many kinds of neuroscientists. And I'm what's called a cognitive neuroscientist. Uh, what a cognitive neuroscientist means uh, is that I study some parts of the brain and not others. So I study these big, blue, colorful parts of the brain and uh, as a cognitive neuroscientist, I don't pay a lot of attention to these two parts of the brain. So this is the brain stem and the cerebellum. These control really unimportant things like your heart rate and breathing, blinking, all of your involuntary functions and your movement. Uh, so we don't care about any of that today. What we do care about are these four big lobes of the brain. Who's heard of the lobes of the brain before? Okay. So we're going to very quickly take a whirlwind tour of the four big lobes of the human brain. Okay. We're going to start here uh, with the frontal lobe of the brain. And so just to orient you, this is what's called a sagittal view of the brain. It's like looking at the brain from the side and somebody looking this direction. Okay? So you're looking at somebody's left 
the left side of their brain. So the eyes would be down here, the forehead is right here. So it makes sense that this is called the frontal lobe of the brain, right? Okay, so neuroscientists, we might be pretty smart, we're not super creative with our names. So the frontal lobe is in the front of your head. This controls a lot of your thinking, reasoning, personality, concentration. Hopefully all of you are engaging your frontal lobes right now while you're listening to me. You're not necessarily paying attention to what your left foot feels like in your left shoe. Uh, you know, that sensation of uh, your pants rustling against your knee. But now you're thinking about those things. And so you've also, you've switched the attention using your frontal lobe from my voice to those sensations that you were previously ignoring, but they were always there. In addition to the frontal lobe, we've got the parietal lobe, which is kind of at the top, the back of your head right here. And the parietal lobe is really focused on sensory integration. It puts together all of your different senses together so that you have one sort of cohesive um, sensory experience. So for example, I am talking to you and you're looking at me right now, so you're using your eyes and your ears. Those are different channels. Your brain kind of puts those things and knits them together so that it feels like one thing, one singular experience. And for the philosophers in the room, uh, it's thought that the roots of human consciousness have something to do with the parietal lobe because it knits together all of those experiences. We've got the occipital lobe here, which is in the back of the head, and it might be kind of a weird place for it, but it's really involved in vision. 25% of your cerebral cortex is involved in just seeing the world around you. And so, and so vision is an incredibly complicated thing that we do. Uh, and that we do it, that it in, in such a way that it feels easy. It's because we have a lot of computational power that we put to it. Finally, we've got this big green lobe. Again, not really green in your brain, um, but the green lobe is called the temporal lobe. It's next to your ears, so you might think that it has something to do with hearing, and it does. It's home to what we call auditory cortex. It's also home to three brain regions, okay? So for those of you who are taking notes, those of you who are paying attention some of the time and not the rest of the time, this is where you want to focus on, because there are three brain regions, and they're going to be important for the rest of today's talk. All right? Are you ready? Okay. The first one is one that you might have heard of. It's called the hippocampus. Who's heard of the hippocampus before? All right, great. Let's see if you've heard of the next one. The parahippocampal formation. Who's heard of that before? Okay. Those of you who have been to my previous talks, got it. <laughs> the hippocampus, the parahippocampal formation, and then the third region is called the entorhinal cortex. Has anyone heard of the entorhinal cortex before? Okay. So those of you who know a little bit of Latin might have an idea of where that is in the brain. It's right next to your olfactory bowl. It's right next to the parts of your brain that you used to smell, which is why it's got that name, into rhinal cortex, like a rhinoceros, uh, a rhinoplasty, <clears throat> all stuff to do with your nose. So the hippocampus, the parahippocampal formation, and the entorhinal cortex, three brain regions that when you stitch them together, comprise a super region that's called the medial temporal lobe, okay? The medial temporal lobe is just, again, neuroscientists, not very creative, it's just the middle of the temporal lobe. That's all the medial temporal lobe means. Now these three regions, the medial temporal lobe, are where memories are reassembled. Which ones? Those three brain regions, the hippocampus, the parahippocampal formation, and the entorhinal cortex. These three regions comprise the medial temporal lobe, and this is where memories are reassembled. Notice that I did not say it's where memories are stored. Memories come from all over your brain. If you're thinking about a memory and how something sounded, you use your auditory cortex. If you're thinking about a memory and thinking about how beautiful or handsome your wife or husband looked, you actually do use parts of your occipital lobe. If you're thinking about how hard you were paying attention at the beginning of this talk and how tired you feel right now, you're going to be using your frontal lobe. All of these signals are reassembled in the medial temporal lobe. Now we're gonna go over those three regions one more time. The hippocampus, the parahippocampal formation, and the entorhinal cortex. These three regions are the principal regions affecting memory. One more thing, these three regions are the most susceptible regions to normal age-related decline. 
okay? So you might think, all right, as I'm getting older, uh, my body is not doing the things that it used to do, maybe it's not doing some of those things so well. Uh, you might think, okay, as I'm getting older, I'm losing brain cells, my brain must be shrinking. That's true in some parts of the brain and less true in other parts of the brain. So, turning back to our big balloon map of the brain, the frontal lobe has a pretty straight line to climb uh, as you get older. If it's this big when you're 20, it's about this big when you're 80, and it kind of steadily shrinks over the course of your life. And it is uh, its biggest when you're in your early 20s. So, uh, I think all of us are on the wrong side of that, even Carolyn. So, sorry. Um, so, all of us are, are kind of on that downward spiral in terms of uh, in terms of how big our frontal lobes are, okay? However, if we compare that to the occipital lobe here in the back of the brain, if it's this big when you're 80, it's about this big when you're 20. It doesn't appreciably change with age at all. It stays about the same size. So you don't really lose any brain cells from this part of your brain, okay? So if some parts change pretty steadily and some parts don't change at all, what do you think happens in the medial temporal lobe? What do you think happens in the hippocampus, the parahippocampal formation, and the enterotic cortex? So it does decline, but it declines in kind of a sad way. It's what we call a curvilinear function with age. Curvilinear just means curvy line, uh, which means that as you're in your 20s and 30s, it stays about the same. Doesn't change a whole lot yeah, through your 40s really doesn't decline. And then when you get into your 50s, it starts shrinking. And then in your 60s, it shrinks a little bit faster. And in your 70s, it shrinks a little bit faster. In your 80s, it shrinks a little bit faster. And the good news is when you get to your 90s, you're pretty much done. It's not going to shrink too much anymore. So, the, <laughs> so the reason why you have senior moments is because the medial temporal lobe changes faster with age than any other part of your brain. It just can't keep up the way the rest of your brain can. Senior moments are normal. It does not mean that you have dementia. It does not mean you need to say, oh Lord, it's finally my turn. <laughs> You're fine, okay? All right, so everybody take a deep breath, let it out. You're fine, okay. So we've talked about memory. We've talked about uh, where memory is in the brain. We've even talked about how the brain changes with age. So, I just have to say it, all of you are basically neuroscientists now, okay? You, you, like, you have the basic knowledge, you know what the brain looks like, you kind of know the main regions of the brain, you know where memories are stored, that's really it, you're good. Okay, so, now, you know, you're no longer my audience, you are my fellow colleagues. And fellow colleagues, I'm going to now talk to you about Alzheimer's disease, okay? Everything we've talked about so far is about normal memory function, normal brain function. The fact that the medial temporal lobe changes with age is part of its normal functioning, typical functioning with age, okay? So now let's talk about Alzheimer's disease, all right? And uh, I just, show of hands, who's heard of Alzheimer's disease before? Okay, all right, good, all right. So now let's talk about what goes wrong in Alzheimer's disease and uh, before I get to that, I want to talk about the leading causes of death. Uh, so these are the latest numbers uh, from the Centers for Disease Control um, at, at, for the year ending 2016. Alzheimer's disease is number six on this list, and it has been for a while. It's been number six on this list for about uh, eight or ten years. But here's the thing. In 1999, it was tenth on the list. And since 1999, Alzheimer's disease has increased by 55%, deaths from Alzheimer's disease, we increase 55% in the United States, okay? So we are really kind of facing a public health crisis because of the 10 leading causes of death, there's only one entry that can't be slowed, prevented, treated, or cured. And that's Alzheimer's disease, okay? So this is why we spend a lot of time trying to work on it. Yes, ma'am. Is that just because of the baby boomer generation aging, or is there something else that's a problem? So the reason why Alzheimer's disease is increasing is actually a little bit complex. So uh, uh, partly it's due to the, the aging of America, largely due to the baby boomers. 
Um, but that said, as of 2018, the baby boomers are no longer America's largest generation. Um, that is now the millennial generation. So, yeah, sorry, millennials, right? Ruining everything, taking everything away. Um, but, uh, so part of it is due to that. Part of it is due to better diagnostic criteria uh, because we've only really been systemically studying uh, Alzheimer's disease since 1984 uh, when the United States federal government really started to open up Alzheimer's disease centers um, and no other country was really putting in that level of concerted effort. So uh, we've hugely improved uh, the way that we understand Alzheimer's disease in the past 35 years, uh, that has also contributed to it. Um, but even while the number has been e increasing, you have to keep in mind that very few people die of Alzheimer's disease. If you hear about it in the news, what's the phrase that, that journalists always say? They died of complications due to Alzheimer's disease. And depending on who the coroner is, sometimes that's ruled Alzheimer's disease, Sometimes that's ruled as a respiratory infection. Sometimes that's ruled as flu and pneumonia. So even though this number is climbing up the list, even though we're getting better at diagnosing it, it's still being underreported as a cause of death, particularly in rural populations. Uh, who sometimes mixes up Alzheimer's disease and dementia? It's okay. All right, I'm a neuroscientist and I do it too. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna give you kind of a quick rundown on the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So dementia is this umbrella term, okay? You can have lots of different kinds of dementia. One of those kinds of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, okay? And there are lots of other kinds here. You can have Parkinson's dementia, frontotemporal dementia, dementia of the Lewy body, mixed dementia, vascular dementia, and of course, the biggest slice of the pie that we see in the United States and many other countries is dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. It is the leading cause of dementia, especially for adults over the age of 65. Okay? So, Alzheimer's disease is one specific type of dementia, but it is by no means the only one. Right? So, uh, let's talk about what Alzheimer's disease is. Okay? So before I talk about what this is, because it probably doesn't look like much to most of you, let's talk about what it's not. This is not a picture of somebody uh, putting their keys in the microwave. This is not a picture of somebody wandering around a familiar neighborhood. This is not a picture of somebody forgetting their spouse's name. This is a blown up silver stain, I know it's pink, slice of the brain. Because when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, it's really important to talk about the physical changes that happen in the brain, okay? So, fellow colleagues, fellow neuroscientists, let's dive on in and understand what's going on in this, in this slide. There are four circles here. Two are black, two are red. Let's start with the red circles. This is referred to as an amyloid plaque. It goes by a whole host of other names, Amyloid, A beta, A beta 42, A B 42. Who's heard of this in some form or fashion? Okay, so some of you, but not all. So amyloid is a protein. Technically, it's a mini protein called a peptide. You have it your whole life, and it's really involved uh, in lipid transport around the brain. So it's like calling a, calling a taxi or an Uber to move fats around your brain. And normally, it's very, very efficient at that process. But in Alzheimer's disease, the formation of amyloid goes wrong, and that's where we have a problem. So the way that I like to talk about it is because I'm a man who mixes many metaphors. Um, let's talk about saran wrap, cling film. Does anybody know what that is? Saran wrap or cling film? That plastic wrap that you can put on your leftovers? Okay, does everybody know what that is? Okay, great. So uh, if you're watching a commercial for for saran wrap, you see, you know, the, the person, the homemaker, lovingly pull it out from that iconic yellow box, tearing that sheet, putting it on top of the potato salad, and just sort of floating to the refrigerator. Because everything has gone perfectly in this person's life. What happens when you try to use it? It's a disaster. And if you're like me, you're really cheap. 
And you can't, you can't get that cling film back. You are throwing those two cents away every time, along with some of your tears. A very similar process happens with amyloid in the brain. It needs to be stretched out to an exact length. It needs to be cut with a couple of enzymes. And if it's done just right, it's smooth and flat and able to kind of ship around your brain. But if it's cut at the wrong length, if it's too long, if it's 42 peptides long or amino acids long, then it springs back on itself and it gets all tangled up. And you can't do anything with it. So when you tangle up that cling film, how many of you are really good at getting it untangled and being able to use it? Okay, most people are saying no. A couple of people are like, yeah, I can do it. All right, way to brag. Good job. But for most of us, it's a lost cause. So imagine, though, if this process was happening in your brain. And imagine if you weren't able to throw away that cling film, and this process went on year after year, decade after decade, building up outside of your brain cells. That's what we've got when it comes to amyloid. So when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, there's a two-stage process. It's not just amyloid. There's also another protein called tau. Tau, T-A-U. Who's heard of tau before? OK. So tau is a protein, again, that you have your whole life. You use it in a lot of different ways. Um, the way that it's most often used in the brain is that it holds the cell walls together. It keeps them rigid. Okay? It's like when you put up a sheetrock in a wall, drywall. There are six known isoforms of tau. It can kind of come up in a lot of different ways. And, but in Alzheimer's disease, it goes wrong in a very particular fashion called hyperphosphorylation. Now, there will not be a quiz at the end of this. You don't have to remember that. But hyperphosphorylation, you can think of it as a poisoning of tau, a weakening of tau. Again, using our, our very mixed metaphors, if we have a wall with water damage to it, can you just paint over that wall? Can you just like pop that bubble and the wall's fine? Why not? Because you need it. Because uh, like, it'll come right back. The wall is damaged. That drywall has been affected. Very similar process happens with this hyperphosphorylation in the brain. Okay? A phosphate group gets added to the tau and weakens the neuron from the inside. So you have this weakening process on the inside, this cling film amyloid coming in from the outside, and together they attack brain cells and cause them to short circuit and die through a process we call apoptosis. Okay? Just means that uh, the brain cell literally short circuits like a mini seizure. So you might think, okay, I am a duly trained neuroscientist. I know that the human brain has about 70 billion neurons. It's okay if I lose one or two due to this process. That's not so bad. However, this process begins, from what we can tell, around 20 years before the onset of memory problems. Not before, you know, but not before the time that you die, not before the time that you pass, not before the time that, where you become incontinent, but before you really understand that it's happening. It's been going on for a couple of decades. So can you imagine having cancer raging in your body for two decades, diabetes untreated for two decades, hypertension for 20 years before you think, maybe I should go to the doctor. This is why it's been so difficult to treat Alzheimer's disease, because we've been starting too late. We've been waiting for somebody to have memory problems instead of looking inside their brain at the amyloid and tau burden and trying to address this. Okay? So this is the staging of Alzheimer's disease. So what we got is a sagittal view of the brain at the top, looking at the side. Down at the bottom, we've got coronal views. This is like looking at somebody straight on. And what you see here, what you can appreciate, is that over the course of Alzheimer's disease, 
you can see that um, you know how tightly packed the folds and the valleys are at first, and they become looser and looser because you're losing those brain cells. You can see how tightly packed these lines are here, and then over the course of Alzheimer's disease, they kind of open up as the brain cells die. So the brain is normally about a three pound organ, and it loses about a third of a pound to half a pound of mass in the process of Alzheimer's disease. So that's a significant part of your brain that's lost to this process of amyloid and tau. So it's no wonder why the people that we love who suffer from Alzheimer's disease change so much over the course of the disease. Now, if that, was if that was all, if you were thinking over the course of Alzheimer's disease, the brain is uniformly affected, unfortunately I have some bad news. The brain is not uniformly affected by Alzheimer's disease. It starts off in some regions and stays in those regions over the course of the disease. Okay? So, it is currently thought that Alzheimer's disease begins in a region called the entorhinal cortex. It then moves through to the parahippocampal formation and really sets up shock in the hippocampus. Now, you might have heard of those three regions before in this talk. It's it. The same three regions that underlie memory, the same three regions that are disproportionately affected by age are the same three regions where Alzheimer's begins and wreaks the most havoc. This is why if you are seeing like a primary care doctor or somebody who's not super experienced and you, and you say to this person that you have memory problems, they might say it could be normal aging, it could be Alzheimer's disease. I don't know. The reason why they don't know is because aging and Alzheimer's disease affect the same parts of the brain. This is why it's important to look at amyloid and tau rather than just memory problems. Yes, sir? Can you have it from your father or your mother or something like that? The question is, can you get Alzheimer's disease from your mother or your father? Uh, and like with many things, the answer is a little bit tricky. Yes and no. Uh, in terms of having a strong chance, like a 100% chance of developing Alzheimer's disease, that is incredibly rare. About 1% of all cases of Alzheimer's disease have that strong familial component. But there are other genetic factors that can increase your risk. Having an immediate family member, only immediate, uh, can increase your risk for Alzheimer's disease uh, by about a factor of two. Uh, and there are, other, uh, there are other genetic markers, like uh, APOE, for example, that uh, also increase your, your likelihood of getting Alzheimer's disease. But it's hard to guarantee that somebody will get Alzheimer's disease or not. Okay, so now let's talk very quickly about the latest in Alzheimer's. We'll get to questions in just a moment, if that's okay. All right. Uh, we'll talk about the very latest in Alzheimer's research. And as I said before, a lot of this stuff is brand new. And even stuff that I've presented before, um, for the two of you who have seen this talk before, uh, some stuff has happened. And it's not exactly what I said before because um, the field is moving that quickly. Um, we just talked about genetics. And I want to just give a quick example of what genetics are like when we're dealing with Alzheimer's disease. So we've got our chromosomes, X and Y. That kind of determines your sex at birth. And then we've got these other 22 guys that are called uh, autosomes. Okay? So the other 22 autosomes kind of govern your risk for developing something like Alzheimer's disease, as well as a host of other factors, whether you're going bald, whether you're, whether you're all have heart disease, things of that nature. However, when we deal with genetics, we are always dealing in probabilities. And we, as humans, are really, really bad at understanding probabilities. Okay? So, we're going to have an interactive example to demonstrate what probabilities look and feel like. And today's the perfect day uh, to do something like that. Okay. So, if I said I am no longer a neuroscientist, I renounce my ways of science, of neuroscience, and I've decided to become a weatherman. I am Channel 5 weatherman Jonathan Jackson, accredited by the American Weather Service and the National Meteorological Society. Um, and I say, there is a 15% chance of rain today. Who's going to bring their umbrella? Who's going to bring their raincoat? Anybody? 
Okay. So we've got uh, one person is going to bring is going to bring a coat. God bless you, sir. All right. Everyone else is going to take their chance, but it's not a zero percent chance, everybody. It's fifteen, which is bigger than zero. All right, so all of you are going to get wet, and we've got one gentleman who's going to be very dry and very smug. Maybe. 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 Okay, all right. Second example. All right. Jonathan Jackson, accredited weatherman, former neuroscientist, cast aside uh, his scientific ways, say that there's now an 85% chance of rain later this afternoon. Who's going to take their umbrella? Who's going to take their raincoat? Okay. All right. Some of you are nodding. Some of you... There's actually a couple of you who are like, nope. <laughs> All right, so those are the, the I, I'm just wondering if any of you have won the lottery recently with, that, with those kinds of odds. Um, okay, so here's where things get interesting. Channel 5 weatherman Jonathan Jackson, I say that there's a 35% chance of rain later today. Who's bringing their umbrella? Okay, and it never fails. There's always somebody in the audience who does this. And I have no idea what that means when it comes to bringing an umbrella. I'm not sure that's a thing. Maybe just bring the top of the umbrella, maybe just the bottom part. Yeah, look at the cane, it's too short. Um, but the truth of the matter is that when you're, you're, when you're dealing with an odds of like 35%, that means some of the time it's going to rain, most of the time it's probably not going to rain. When it comes to the genetics of Alzheimer's disease or any other inherited disease, oftentimes we are living in that 35% range. <clears throat> Where you're gonna say, I know some people with this genetic profile who definitely got it. And there's a few people who didn't. It's hard to say. Okay? And until we get a lot better at polygenic risk scores, which I'm happy to talk about later, right now we're gonna be living in that gray area where it happened to some people but not to everybody. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to give you three updates on the, in the field of Alzheimer's disease. This is not the only updates that have been occurring. These are just the three that I thought were really cool. Okay. So the first one is called focused ultrasound scanning. And I talked about this in August, but there have been updates since August. Um, so does everybody know what an ultrasound is? Most of us are probably familiar with it um, if you're dealing with like a, a pregnant woman or sometimes with like a, like a maybe cancer that can be in your belly. Um, so it's really nice normally you get to squirt that worm goo and like rub this magic wand all over your belly. It's great. Um, it turns out that you can weaponize that technology in the fight against Alzheimer's disease. Who knew? Uh, by, t by tuning the ultrasound frequency to a very particular bandwidth, you can open up something called the blood-brain barrier, okay? So for those of you who are taking notes, we're going to define what this is. The blood-brain barrier, <clears throat> it's kind of complicated, is a barrier between your blood and your brain. That's really, that's really it, I'm sorry. It's, that's all there is. It's literally a barrier between your blood system and your brain system. It keeps them separate. It's why, um, you know, when you get a cold, you feel lousy, but you don't necessarily hallucinate. Uh, unless you are uh, very, very sick. So, uh, you can selectively open this blood-brain barrier in such a way that two things can happen. One is you can deliver tiny amounts of medicine targeted to specific regions of the brain to take care of the problem of Alzheimer's disease. This is great because you don't need as many of the drugs, and the drugs are so precisely delivered that it lowers the chances of side effects due to the medicine or due to the focus ultrasound. Uh, the second thing you can do is you can also introduce lysosomes from your blood system into your brain. Lysosomes are like the all-star garbage bin of the brain. So like if you have those days where you hopefully pull, pull out like that old pull-out sofa that you've had for 30 years, you kind of put that on the curb and you hope that it's gone when you get home from work. Lysosomes are the guys that will be like, yeah, we'll take it. You know, they're the ones that will kind of break down anything, anything, even amyloid plaques, and remove them from the brain. So, um, without killing them? Uh, exactly, without killing anybody. So, when I first started giving uh, this particular update, it was in 2015, and I said, this, this technology is incredibly safe. It's worked really, really well. It's restored the memories of each and every one of the 10 rats that they've done it on. <laughs> it was very, very promising. That was in 2015. 
What I've got here, it's a little bit hard to see this picture with this light, is the first human subject in a clinical trial looking at focused ultrasound therapy and Alzheimer's disease. This was done in Toronto, Canada in 2017. That trial closed at the end of 2017. They reported out in July of 2018 and found that it was very safe and reasonably, and reasonably effective in humans. So uh, in August, I said, they're about to start a, a second clinical trial. I can't tell you where it is, but I know it's starting soon. That second clinical trial started September 28th of this year, and there are going to be four sites in the United States this time. One of the sites is in West Virginia, of all places. They have not announced the other three yet, but they are looking for another 10 to 15 individuals to test out this therapy stateside. Okay? Uh, and so this is not necessarily going to be a classic FDA phase study, for those of you who know what that is. This is outside of it because you're repurposing an existing technology. So what that means is, all that gobbledygook, is that this can advance much more quickly through the research pipeline uh, than normal new drugs. So if this is effective, we could be seeing it uh, available as a therapy within the next three to five years, easily. Okay, so focus ultrasound scanning from 10 rats to people in three years flat. Not too bad. Um, this is uh, a study that was released last week in Nature Communications. And it's talking about a theory that's been kind of kicked around and whispered and you know, the dusty pubs that, uh, that Alzheimer's researchers frequent. Um, that's not true. Um, about the idea of subtypes of Alzheimer's disease. The fact that Alzheimer's disease may not be just one thing. Might be a couple of things. Might be three or four things. Depending on how the disease progresses throughout the brain. So this is something that's been whispered since I first started doing Alzheimer's research about 15 years ago. But we've never had the ability to understand that pathology precisely. So uh, there was a really wonderful uh, group of laboratories uh, in London, England, that got about 1,300 brains from uh, uh, brain scans um, and just kind of stitched them together using artificial intelligence and machine learning. And they figured out that Alzheimer's disease does different things. So it's not like most of the time it looks one way and then the rest of the time it looks another way. There are basically three paths of Alzheimer's disease. And the one that I told you about today, where Alzheimer's disease starts in the entorhinal cortex, moves on through the parahippocampal formation, and nests in the hippocampus, that only happens one in three times. Another one in three times, we have another, a kind of a cortical progression that starts off uh, again near the entorhinal cortex, but then moves back. It sort of leaves the frontal lobe alone and attacks the occipital lobe of the brain. And then the third type is what's called subcortical. So it attacks the inside of your brain and leaves the outside alone until later in the disease. So what the long and the short of this means is that there are three different flavors of Alzheimer's disease. We've all been considering them as one thing. Maybe that's another reason why it's been so hard to cure, because we're trying to cure three things by doing it one way. And maybe that's why the symptoms that we see for various people also change. Some people just seem to have memory problems. Some people have really huge personality changes. Some people have problems with thinking more than memory. And for a long time we said, well, maybe that's not Alzheimer's, maybe that's a different kind, maybe that's frontotemporal dementia. But what this new analysis shows, again, this is just released last week, so we're still trying to figure out what it means, suggests that Alzheimer's disease, as we know it, might be three things. And it remains to, it remains to be seen what those three things look like and whether those three things affect everybody equally. But it does seem to be a third of the time we have that normal presentation, and then the other two thirds of the time, it looks kind of different. So this might be the start of a whole new era of understanding Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the third thing I want to talk about is about a drug called BAN2401. Has anyone heard of this drug? It's got a really catchy name. So BAN2401 is a drug uh, <clears throat> that, uh, you know, at this time last year, was well on its way to be, being declared a failure. 
Uh, it was a drug that was designed to try to remove the amyloid, the problematic amyloid plaques from the brain, and we were not good at dealing with it. Okay? So we've done this a few times. We've kind of gotten close in some studies. The rest of the studies have been massive failures. This one looked like another massive failure. In fact, in December of 2017, uh, the people who made the drug said, you know what, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, we give up. And then what they happened uh, is in, in, in early July of 2018, they said, wait, 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 hold on guys, hold on. We took another look, totally worked. Totally worked. So what does that mean? What does it mean when a drug works in the fight against Alzheimer's disease? So this has been defined formally by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. The FDA says that if you want to say that your drug can work in the fight against Alzheimer's disease, it has to do two things. One, you have to get rid of the amyloid. There has to be less amyloid after you've done your work than when you started. The second thing is that you have to slow the rate of cognitive decline compared to people who didn't get the drug. So you don't have to reverse the symptoms, but you have to make that, that decline slower, okay? So a shallower incline or decline. According to the second round of analysis that was announced like July 3rd, 2018, like right before federal holiday, showed that they reduced the amyloid burden in the highest dose condition by 93%, which is effectively removing pretty much all of it. <clears throat> and they cut the rate of cognitive decline in half over about a four to five year period. So, did it get rid of amyloid? Yes. Did it slow cognitive decline? Also yes. <clears throat> So on the surface of it, it looks like band 2401 is the first therapy to meet both clinical endpoints and is potentially an effective treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Okay? So many people thought we would never get to this point. We are now at the stage where we have a drug that seems to work. There are a lot of caveats. We're not, we're not completely sure. It is one of the most complicated research designs that has ever been attempted in the Alzheimer's space. It's so complicated that they announced this in January. We're still going through the results. We're still trying to figure it out. There were some weird changes that happened halfway through the study. They moved uh, some people from one condition to another condition. They tried to figure out if everybody was still healthy. Um, they tried to stop it halfway through and then restarted it. A lot of crazy things happened in this trial. So we're not sure if what we're seeing is completely real. We're just partially real. But we do know that what we're seeing with band 2401 is just an extension of other things that we've seen along the way. There are four other drugs that are currently in clinical trials that can definitely reduce amyloid. And of these four other drugs, they see small reductions uh, in the rate of cognitive decline, but they're not big enough to say, yes, we definitely see them. So even if this drug is a complete failure, even if, it, even if it's, you know, these things kind of go away, we know we're on the right track because we're, we're getting good at seeing these type of results. This is the fifth time we've done it. So we're getting really, really close to an effective treatment. And over the next two years, we're gonna be starting to announce the results of other clinical trials that are doing the same thing with fancier methods. So between now and the end of 2020 is really the crucial time to say whether or not we're making headway in the fight against Alzheimer's disease. Okay? So, um, we're getting close. So there's no cure for Alzheimer's disease, but clinical trials are getting awfully close. Awfully close. Um, so there are a lot of next generation treatments, but I'm gonna spend the next five or six minutes <clears throat> moving ahead to how to age gracefully, and then I'd like to uh, answer some of your questions. So we've talked a lot about Alzheimer's disease and memory and the brain, and You've all become neuroscientists. Um, <clears throat> how do you stop your brain from moving into these phases of dementia? How do you slow that rate of dementia? Um, there are a number of handy hints that I can give you that are based on science. One of them is to use external cues. Please don't do this. <laughs> but using post-it notes are helpful and friendly. It's not outsourcing your memory. It's not giving up. It's another way of trying to remember that information by writing it down. Using post-it notes, and then you know, put them on your desk, on your chair, 
on your dog, on your spouse's forehead, whatever it is that you need to kind of make that memory a little bit more distinct. Test yourself. Quizzing yourself on this information is, is extremely effective. So how many of you sometimes have trouble with names and faces? Like you can remember one thing, but you cannot remember the other. That's because names and faces are among the hardest type of memory to remember, to, to retreat. Because both pieces of information are arbitrary. So, you know, I told you my name is Jonathan, but it could have just as easily been Leroy or Kenneth. And there's nothing inherently Jonathan about my face. So that's why it's so hard to keep those two things in mind. So the best way to remember this, the best way to remember any information, is to quiz yourself in your head repeatedly. So if you're at a party and you're meeting somebody, you can say their name right when you first meet them. Say it again after a couple of minutes of conversation. Say it a third time as you're parting ways. And just doing it three times, obviously the more, the, the more you can do it, the better. Just doing it those three times, you are more likely to remember that person's name after a year than any other method. Any, any other method of studying or trying to remember. So better than flashcards, better than highlighting, better than uh, you know, trying to put them out like in a yearbook and memorizing their names that way. Just try to say it a few times while you're talking to them. Quiz yourself in your head, say it out loud, whatever it is that you need to do. Testing yourself is really effective. Um, I always feel silly with, when I put up this slide when I come out to a senior center. Uh, be intellectual, be, be, be social. Uh, it's best if you can do both of these things at the same time. Um, basically, do what you're doing now. Uh, get out, be part of kind of the activities. Uh, I highly recommend uh, being deeply involved with your senior center because these things are intellectually demanding. They also tend to be cheap or free. Um, and they tend to work a lot better than crossword puzzles and Sudoku in terms of trying to maintain that intellectual sharpness. <clears throat> crossword puzzles and Sudoku are fine, um, but they will not stop the march of dementia. So you can be, you know, maybe 85 years old, very, very demented, but still very good at crossword puzzles and Sudoku. Uh, but if you want to do a little bit more with that, you have to have uh, a kind of a life, lifelong, whole body embracing of uh, intellectual and social pursuits. So try to learn a new language. If you have the means to travel, do so. You don't have to go to Italy. You can just, you know, go across the state. Go to Pittsfield. Meet somebody there. Say hi. Read a book. Get your heart pumping. Uh, so everybody needs to run a marathon like this 90-year-old Japanese man. Or, or you can just get up a couple of extra times and walk around your room, walk around your home, walk around your block, walk around your city. Every little bit helps. If you're doing a little bit more than you were doing the day before, your heart's going to thank you. And when your heart thanks you, your brain also thanks you. Okay? So cardiovascular exercise is the best kind for your brain. Um, other kinds of exercise, yoga, stretching, and toning, uh, they're good for helping you relax. But in terms of trying to physically help your brain, it has to be cardiovascular. Lower your stress. It's that time of year, guys. Holiday season. You've got that uncle who gets a little drunk and starts talking about politics at the table. <laughs> You've got the stress of those holiday gifts. You forgot how to cook a turkey. <laughs> stress is toxic. And I don't mean that in like the kumbaya, let's all come to Jesus sense. I, I mean it literally. Stress is a toxin uh, that can alter your brain functioning. The first paper that I ever published uh, was on the effects of stress in the context of Alzheimer's disease. Individuals who are highly stressed are twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease as those who are in the low stress group. Okay? So whatever it is that you have to do, if you have to end Thanksgiving early this year, if you have to ban alcohol, if you have to uninvite somebody, do what you got to do to lower your stress. And for on a more serious note, those of you who are care partners, caregivers, caretakers, take time for yourself. I'm sure this is something you've heard from a million people a million times. There's nothing more important for your body and your brain than to take time for yourself. I know that you might feel guilty or that you feel like you can't, but it is incredibly important. It also makes you a better care partner in the long run too. Okay? So keep that in mind. Get some sleep. Who gets the same amount of sleep every night? They go to bed at the same time, they wake up at the same time. Every single day. Okay. So those of you with your hands raised, have good sleep hygiene. 
The rest of you have poor hygiene. <laughs> poor sleep hygiene, okay? So keep in mind that sleep hygiene is just as important as any other kind of bodily hygiene. Try to get that rest. Uh, you don't have to stay asleep all night. It's natural to wake up once or twice. If you can't get back to sleep, get out of bed. Because you don't just want to lie awake staring at the ceiling, okay? That doesn't help either. So try to ban glowing screens, whether it's a phone or a computer or a television. Try not to have those in the bedroom. Try to rest up. Uh, keep up healthy diet and weight. Usually when I give this talk, I like to rant and rave about the Mediterranean diet, but we don't have enough time today. The Mediterranean diet, in short, is the real deal. Um, it lowers your risk of Alzheimer's disease, lowers your risk of a lot of other chronic diseases too. Uh, you might be wondering what's on it, and this is when I sort of very quietly look at each and every one of you, and I say, you know what's on the Mediterranean diet. <laughs> you know what's on the Mediterranean diet, and you just don't want to know, okay? <laughs> All the things that you know you should be eating more of, but you don't. You gotta get rid of the red meat. You have to get rid of the animal fat. Cut out the flour and the sugar and the grease. No more bacon. That's right. So some of you are saying, Jonathan, whoa, whoa, whoa. I am here for a good time, not a long time. That's the difference between the Mediterranean diet and maybe, maybe a little bit about what you're doing. The good thing about the Mediterranean diet is that you don't have to be amazing at it to see an effect. You can be bad at the Mediterranean diet and still lower your risk of dementia. So if you can only replace one meal a week with the Mediterranean diet, your body will thank you, your brain will thank you. Obviously it would be great if you could replace 21 meals a week with the Mediterranean diet, but uh, the more you can do, the better, all right? Some things that are permitted on the Mediterranean diet, uh, berries, blueberries in particular, uh, nuts, red wine, and dark chocolate. White wine and milk chocolate, no. Uh, no, no, steak, steak is, steak is, steak is better. Unless it's a cauliflower steak. Maybe, maybe that doesn't count, but all right. Uh, so the Mediterranean diet is mostly vegetable based. If you need to have meat, it needs to be fish uh, or occasionally poultry, okay? So that's the Mediterranean diet, it does work. Um, and then the last thing that you can do, you can help us research. Uh, the biggest thing that's stopping us from being able to declare that we have a treatment for Alzheimer's disease is just the number of people we need in research studies. In the next 10 years, we are going to need to screen 600,000 people for Alzheimer's disease studies alone. So we talk about how a mysterious cure to cancer is in the Amazon rainforest. There are treatments, likely effective treatments, already in clinical trial stages here in the United States, as close as Boston. But we don't have enough people to sign up for those studies to know whether they work or not. Okay? So if it's something that's in the cards for you or for a loved one, please consider clinical research. You can obviously talk to Carolyn, uh, who represents one of the most cutting edge research facilities, um, not just in Boston, but in the world, actually. Um, so talk to Carolyn uh, for your sake for someone else. Okay. So, those are uh, kind of some advice, some tips about how to age gracefully. Uh, I think I'm going to stop there, and I will, I'm happy to answer a few questions, but because I, I am so over time and so late, uh, I'm going to let the rest of you go, and I'll, I'll stick around and answer questions until everybody's, everybody's satisfied. All right? Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. in the back with the red shirt, you've been so patient. What is your question? I have Alzheimer's disease. Thank you for being here. And my father, who was in the Second World War, he developed it first. And I had a very rigid job. I made millions of dollars in my job. And I got it too. And I've had it ever since. And I'm 71. 73, 74 years old. And my wife, God bless her, just had a very strong service, having one of her legs changed for titanium but we're still alive, but I can't do the things. I memorize a few things, but it isn't, it isn't that easy. Yes, sir. And then I forget them very easily. Well, thank you for sticking with this talk for an hour. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't get it all. <laughs> I got about this much of it. Yeah. You got yeah. about that much but of it? You're very, very patient. Honestly, if you, if you take away this much of all the things that I said, you are right on track with everybody else in this room. I can remember where I live, and it's great and all that. Yes, I am. 
So it sounds like you're still you're doing pretty well. So thank you for coming out. Thank you for being part of today. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I am, uh, was recently diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's, um, and all of those things, Mediterranean diet, exercise, yes. Yes. that's me all over. Um, I don't eat sweets, I don't eat sugar, I don't, you know, I don't smoke, I don't, whatever. And. Um, there's no no uh, existence of Alzheimer's in my family, ever, going back you know, forever. So I'm wondering, is there an element of environmental uh, aspects? Uh, so the, the question is, are there, are there potentially environmental contributions uh, that affect your risk for Alzheimer's disease? So before I answer that, I wanna, I wanna make one thing very, very clear. You can do everything right and still get Alzheimer's disease, okay? So it is not your fault. It is not your family's fault. This is the reason why I did the, the weatherman thing, is that even at a very low percent risk, it still happens to some of us, okay? It is not your fault. Now, when it comes to environmental risk, this is an emerging area of research that is mainly being done by epidemiologists. Uh, who kind of study the way that disease uh, kind of bubbles up and moves around uh, in like large geographical areas. Uh, it turns out that there does appear to be some environmental factors when it comes to Alzheimer's disease. In particular, living in a highly polluted area, uh, a densely urban area, or conversely, sometimes very, very rural areas where you don't necessarily get regular care for a lot of other comorbid conditions, all seem to increase your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Now, it is very likely that there are many toxins, some of which we know about, some of which we don't, uh, that may affect our disease risk. But I will say some of the ones that you've heard rumors about, like aluminum or tin, those are not, environment, those are not substantial environmental factors. Uh, we are talking about um, some of the things that uh, are usually like man-made, uh, large, much larger, more systemic contributions. I grew up in Los Angeles, uh, um, and um, where before all of the uh, automobile uh, restraints, you know, in terms of affecting the air, so there were many times that uh, schools were closed because of the air quality. We were one of the first to recognize that because we were one of the first to experience that density. Yes. Um, and and so. And even though I'm an outdoor person, that was my upbringing was in the inner, in the inner city. Yes, yeah, so uh, it, it all, that actually makes me, makes me, I want to bring up one more point, which is that um, we're learning more and more that even though Alzheimer's disease is something that we, can th we think of as something that happens to <coughs> older adults, you know, there are individuals with early onset who are not older adults who suffer from, from its effects. And beyond that, we're also learning that many of the risk factors in Alzheimer's disease are rooted in childhood. So childhood uh, exposures to pollution, to education, to regular health care, all have lifelong effects even if you overcome them by the time you turn 18. So, you know, it's, it's certainly possible that growing up in a very smoggy, polluted environment like Los Angeles uh, may have kind of set you on this path. It's difficult to know, it's impossible to know for sure whether there was an environmental risk factor, uh, but there is emerging evidence to suggest that that's the case. Well, it's the one thing we all, we all breathe the same air eventually, we all drink the same water eventually, and the soil is, uh, our food comes from the same soil eventually, and all of those things have been polluted. So yes. here we are. Here we are. Um, so I, I think we're gonna stop there um, I will stay here for a few minutes for questions, but I want to give people a chance to, to head out if they need to do something else with their day. Um, but again, thank you so much for your time. I, I really enjoyed uh, being able to speak to you today. I just wanted to add one more thing off of what you just actually said. Um, when he said that you know having dementia or Alzheimer's is not your fault, you did nothing wrong, your family did nothing wrong, it, it, it is what it is. Unfortunately, also I want to mention that 
it is nothing that we should ever be ashamed of. Um, I, I, am, I really believe this 150% with every ounce of my being. Um, we should never be ashamed, embarrassed, or upset if we or someone that we love has been diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's. You wouldn't be embarrassed if someone you love was diagnosed with diabetes or high blood sugar or you know, a heart condition. So there's absolutely no reason that we should ever be ashamed if someone that we love or ourselves are diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's. It is time that we embrace it, we accept it, we acknowledge it, and then we fight it together as a community. And that is why I'm so passionate about us becoming a dementia-friendly community. Because it's about time that everybody knew and understood that it's here, it's happening, let's work with it, let's fix it, let's fix it, and let's treat everyone with the same respect that we should treat everybody. So please, don't, don't ever let anything like this stop you from acknowledging that you have it, dealing with it, expressing it, talking about it, and being open about it. This is how we're going to conquer it. So, that's yeah. it. Jackson, pull him aside and pick his brain before he leaves because he's amazing. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. <laughs>